So uh, first up, thank you very much for, for coming to uh, the Chamber of Commerce uh, tax debate. Um, tax is uh, not normally known for its uh, riveting discussion, but hopefully the panel we've assembled here, well, I'm not hopefully, I'm absolutely certain that the panel that we've assembled here will, will give us a lot of insights into, uh, into the tax debate that we're having at the moment on the island. Um, so first up, very brief introductions of everyone here. Um, Firstly, myself, I'm Stephen Rooksell. I'm the Finance uh, and Professional Services Sector Lead for the Chamber of Commerce. I also sit with a number of people on, on various different committees, uh, GIBA and uh, GIFA as Vice Chair. Um, so, introductions for the panel. Um, we have, uh, first, of all, first of all, we have John Moulton. Uh, John uh, needs very little introduction uh, as his accomplishments in the investment world speak for themselves really in the running and founding of various PE firms such as Pr Primera, Apex, CBC, Alchemy and Better Capital. Locally, John is very well known as the retiring chair of the International Stock Exchange and as past chair of Orany, and more recently as the founder and director of GPEG. So, um, next up we have Joe, Joe Huxtable. Joe is the tax partner based in Guernsey for Deloitte and is responsible for tax practice um, across the Channel Islands. Joe is chair of the GSCCA and sits on GIBA Council uh, as its representative. Uh, Joe's worked closely with government industry on the implications of the international tax changes such as BEPS and uh, the tax substance requirements that we've recently had brought in. Uh, next up, we have Charles Parkinson. Charles is a long-standing de deputy having held positions in government since 2004 uh, to the present date and is currently the vice president of STSB, uh, having previously held positions such as president of economic development, president of STSB and, and, uh, and uh, minister for the treasury and resources. And finally, we have Dr. Andy Sloan. Dr. Sloan is an economist, strategist, and non-executive director who's held various positions within the, within the Guernsey government, uh, and Andy is, has led Guernsey's ESG strategy for several years and is the founder of the International Sustainability Institute for the Channel Islands. So please, can you give all of your panelists a warm welcome? So before I start, I just think I'd quite like to ask you as an audience, um, what what you, do you feel there is a need for tax and fiscal reform within Guernsey? All you need to do is put your hand up if it's a yes and keep it down if it's a no. So do you feel there is a need for tax fiscal reform? Hands up or down? That's, you've already convinced them guys, well done. <laughs> so um, for the assumptions for this debate, we're going to, I, I, I've set out some assumptions and I've given those assumptions to the panelists and I've, I've also given them a number of questions to go through. So for the assumptions that we've made for this debate, that there is a hole in the public finances and this hole ranges from between 50 to 100 to some estimates as high as 200 and above uh, million, depending on the assumptions that you make and depending on the inputs that you have. One of the major issues on this debate is that there is no clear, concise description of what makes up this shortfall, but I'll leave that to the panelists to cover. Um, the assumption for this panel session uh, is, is made that, that something actually needs to be done about it. Now, I, I personally don't propose to delve into any of this, this that's the job of the panel, um, but equally, you know, spending cuts, decisions, priorities, prioritization all equally come into this debate and all of these things uh, hopefully will be covered by the panel. So without further ado, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to open up with the first question. So, John, uh, first question goes to you. And John, uh, there is, I think, a, a general consensus, obviously, from the room we've just seen that, that, that something needs to be done about the fiscal situation in Guernsey uh, and, and, and the situation that it finds itself in, and that policy decisions um, in five to, uh, needs to be taken now to avoid much harder discussion, uh, discussions and decisions in five to 10 years' time. Some say cut, some say grow, some say tax, some say borrow. Um, all no doubt have their place. What are your views on the various options available and the challenges of each one? Do you want to press your button next? First thing is that we really struggle with knowing what the blasted number is because raising taxes is quite challenging if you don't know how much you need. Um, we have an accounting system for the states which is just a blasted disgrace. Uh, and uses strange accounting practices of its own, uh, which very few people can follow. Um, in my experience, that includes most, most of the states. Um, that it's just too hot. Um, we have very strange language to, to describe the deficit. Charles was vocal on this as long ago as eight years ago, I was able to find on the web. 
saying what a load of rubbish it was, and it is. So we don't know whether we need 50 or 200, really. Um, we have some massive risks as well, which we do need to focus on more. The work plan for the government doesn't touch on what is the largest liability that the state has, which is the civil service pension fund which in itself could quite easily, given recent inflation rates, be £100 million a year extra spend, quite easily. So there's a huge amount of risk in the numbers. Um, there are a variety of papers you can whip off the web um, talking about different projects, prioritizations uh, for capital spending over the last few years. I think it's been three big publications in the last couple of years. Um, they're not small. Um, the efforts at attacking this paper come in at two, over 200 pages a time. But they don't mean anything because there's too, too much nonsense in the numbers. Um, we have massive risks in electricity, where we are very dependent upon cheap French electricity. Now, three years ago, France had the lowest cost of electricity in Europe. As of last week, it has the most expensive in Europe because they're actually having to buy electricity from the Germans. Those of you who have been following the Ukrainian war will have worked out in a few seconds just what a level of risk that is. We have no continuity of supply or fixed price in a couple of years' time. Big risk. And if we're going to cover up for that and do our green agenda, for which there's nothing budgeted, really, nothing significant anyway, We've got to do something to cover all the electric vehicle charging points. Otherwise, you're going to be driving along the road watching the smoke come up from the melting cables. Assume we've got any power to put down them. The pen if the inflation stays high, we've got massive pen pension problems, both for the state's scheme and for the general scheme for the population. They're big numbers. So we need to worry a lot about these things. Um, we need to have a view on what size of state we want. Do we want to replicate everything in our government that some of the major governments in Europe do? Now, this is a big decision. There's no particularly right answer as to whether you want a very social state or a very capitalist state. But the, it is clear that if we move to a very social state, our financial services industry is likely to suffer very badly. And we are heavily dependent on financial services. Taxes come in all kinds of flavors if we've got to decide which ones to do. It's about, you know, which knife would you choose to be killed with type of question. Um, income taxes um, are painful on growth. There's every evidence in the world that higher income tax, higher value added taxes, GVAs, whatever, um, will lead to lower economic growth. Uh, it's also the case that high social security spending which we're doomed to have because of our, our age structure and inflation, correlates with low growth quite strongly. That's across a very large number of nations. So we've got all kinds of things to worry about here, but getting to what the right tax is, you have to decide the size of the whole. Um, and once you've decided what the size of the whole is and what people want to do, I mean, you don't, you know, insanely, you don't have to have a health service. Of course, everybody wants one. So we've decided to have a health service. That's fine. No, no argument at all. But we have to decide what it is that we want and how far we go down that road, how much we provide support for the population. One final thought. Um, in terms of contributors to the state's budget, there's something less than 10,000 individuals who fund the entire population. Everybody else puts less in in taxes or no taxes and takes something out. So we've got a very large chunk of our population, surprisingly large, um, which is actually in a situation where it's in favor of spending by the government because they don't fund it. Somebody else does. There's a risk there. It's a very real risk. It's happened in other economies. Um, and again, it's largely a political issue. You know, just how much of that you're going to do, how much you're going to try and soak the rich, and how much can you soak them. I've rambled on far too long. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. Thank you.
Next up, uh, Andy, um, you publicly stated that you believe the capacity for tax increases is su substantially less than, the, than that outlined by, uh, by P&R. Um, what are the dangers of increasing taxes if there is no headroom within the economy? Um, well, the simple answer is it makes us poorer and uh, less internationally competitive. Um, but frankly, what bothered me, and you were referring to an article I wrote in the Guernsey Press last September, was that this notion of headroom, um, which the state uses, is quite misleading. As John said, you can do what you like with it. But it implies there's some predetermined capacity of tax burden and a, and a preferred size of the state that we're aiming towards. And frankly, it can be 100% if you want it to, because it's called communism. It doesn't necessarily work. But what the condition does is it preconditions the debate. So you've, you've already sort of mentally preconditioned yourself to a sort of headroom. There's space for more taxes. It's like a free pass when you debate it. And it gives the, you know, the impression there's a Goldilocks amount of spending that we're aiming for. And that's what I was, you know, was harumphing about. And I had a thousand words to do it back in September. I did it very well. And a few people sort of said they didn't follow what I was saying at the time. So I ain't likely to make that point again today. But the point was that back then I made a point, it was effectively our national newspaper, um, saying that the states either had got its calculations wrong, deliberately, or by accidentally. So either way, it's incompetence or misleading, and I got no response whatsoever, other than in the states we got a defence of public sector pay rises, which I hadn't mentioned at all. <laughs> But, um, you know, because they're apparently they're a sensitive soul. I know a lot of people at the States, and, and they can be on occasion if you put them in the wrong direction. But on that point, my point was about pay, if you look at the States, is that in 2008, Charles was just taken over as Treasurer, but it's in the States uh, accounts, the pay bill was 106, sorry, Deputy yeah. Party Minister. In, no, no, it became Minister. Yeah. The pay bill for the states was 162 million quid. In 2022, next this year, I should say, it's forecast to be 267 million quid. Now, that's a real increase, ignore inflation, of 25%. Um, or it's, you know, if in, our, in other money, it's 115 million. In revenue terms, net revenue expenditure by the states was 292 million. In 2022, it's 527 million. Okay, well, let's knock out the extra spending on health, but I'm going to put back in fees and charges, which never get, makes it onto the books. And either way, it's a real increase of 30%. That's a third. Um, now, GDP, though, in that time period, you go to the States, between 2010 and 20, uh, 2020, it's gone from 2.4 to 3.2 billion. And that's in nominal terms. But in real terms, as in after you've taken the effects of inflation, it's 7%. So our spending has gone up by 30%, and that's ignoring Social Security. Like, we'll come on to that in a moment. But that, our income has gone up, our GDP is 7%, but spending, public spending has gone up by 30%. Now, why is this all important? Because we had the conversation earlier. If you don't really understand where you are or where you're going, you're going to make, make some missteps going forward. Now, the tax lines, when I came here, by the way, I'm talking about taxation and the burden, um, was 50% more than the UK and the personal tax allowance. And today it is, I can't do the maths quick enough, but it's about 400 quid less than the UK, the personal tax burden. So there's a, a, a small indication. Now, like I said, why is it important? Because we need to know where we're going. Now, especially in Guernsey, because it's very difficult to follow the numbers, as John said. I mean, I, 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 can, I know the numbers, and I, I learned the numbers so I can follow them, but it's very, very difficult to try and fathom anything out from the state's website. But people spend so much time spinning the line that we're great and we're wealthy and we're doing so well and we're the top 10 jurisdiction in the world and we're per capita income, blah, 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 is they miss some really important points. And like the, the way that things have changed over the last 10, 15 years. We go on about our fund sector last year having a great year. Well, Luxembourg's alternative fund sector grew by tenfold in the last 10 years. So get with the programme and appreciate our relative economic performance. In 2011, finance sector upper quartile earnings was 74,100. Last year, it was 74,547 pounds. That's an increase of 447 pounds over 10 years without taking into account inflation. So the tax burden on individuals is a serious matter because our earnings haven't been going up. I won't get into the public sector relative to the, the finance sector because that's a story for another day. But 
Because if you do, you get a sensitive response, like I said. I offered myself up as a, a fiscal policy panel uh, arbiter in the last Guernsey Press article. And one senior civil servant I saw at the, uh, uh, the, the, the Lions the other day said, um, I said, I ain't got a call from PNR, you know, I'm a bit surprised. I said, well, you're not going to win friends and influencing people by the stuff you write in, this, in, in the paper, are you? Well, it's not about winning friends and influencing people. It's about being truthful and honest about ourselves and where we are. Because if we're going to try and figure out how we're going to fund ourselves going forward, we need to be honest about where we are now. And I'll come back to the where we go. My next question. Thank you very much, Andy. Much appreciated. Charles, in uh, 2017 and in several papers uh, over the last decade, in fact, uh, there have been various plans setting out the, uh, the impending fiscal challenges. Uh, so this is a well-known and well-trodden path. People have acknowledged throughout various state terms that there are challenges. These challenges, as we've just heard, have only grown since then. But what way do you, do you think that we could fill the gap? Well, um, you will know that uh, I'm a keen advocate of uh, corporate tax reform, and <clears throat> we may get on into the detail of that um, during the course of this debate. Um, it's, it's a subject that's actually too complicated, really, to deal in this format of... Uh, of a debate so if anyone would like to receive a copy of the paper I published a couple of months ago on this subject I've left some forms at the back of the room and you can just put your name and email address and you'll receive it this afternoon but um, I think uh, corporate tax reform is an essential precursor to any other fiscal reform because uh, we're reaching an impasse um, it's quite clear that uh, the uh, policy lead for fiscal policy on the policy and resources committee would like to introduce a GST. It's equally clear that uh, a GST will not be accepted by this state. And it's equally clear that if that's an election issue in three years time, uh, candidates who stand on a platform of uh, proposing that they support GST are likely to have a rough time. So, um, my view has been uh, all along that uh, the public uh, will not wear, frankly, uh, increased personal taxes and taxes on the resident individual population unless they feel that the system is working out fairly. And, and to them, and to, or to many of them, that means that uh, companies doing business on this island must make a contribution to the cost of our public services. And uh, so I, I, I'm, I've never been a person to say uh, we will not introduce a GST or any other um, tax. Uh, it's possible we won't need to, um, but it is all equally possible that we might. All I'm saying is that it's politically impossible to make those sorts of changes until we modernise and restructure our corporate tax system. Thank you very much, Charles. Joe. Um time now to hear from a tax practitioner's point of view. Uh, we've, we've been given a, an example of tax reform from Charles there, um, corporation tax reform. Equally, we've heard in the news of changes to the corporation tax coming down the track from the OECD. Could you give us a, a tax practitioner's view on the challenges and opportunities of, of, of various tax reform that, that are, are available? Yeah, thanks very much, Stephen. Um, and I will approach this very much from a tax practitioner's perspective. Um, and I think the two areas you asked me to comment on were particularly the territorial tax and then also some of the um, OECD developments. Um, I mean, a territorial tax um, is a tax which um, is attributed to the profits sourced in Guernsey. Um, and the idea is we'd have a sort of standard rate of, say, 10 or 15 percent. And I think one of the opportunities with such a reform to the corporate tax system is we would end up with what might be seen as a normalised tax with a, a standard positive rate of tax. And that, you know, as, as we've seen, could be very positive in terms of our ability to um, avoid scrutiny and challenge from, from, uh, from organisations like the OECD and the EU. So that's definitely an opportunity. There's also another argument that by having a standard positive rate of tax, um, we could enter into more double tax treaties. And that's something where I think many of us have found we've been lacking and it's been our 0% rate of tax that has kind of held us back. But if I just think for a minute about this type of tax from, from a purely tax practitioner's perspective, it does have complexities. You know, there is an element of um, greyness around determining where the source of profits are. Um, it might be great for tax advisors, but I think the, the risk is with something like a territorial tax, it would reduce tax certainty because you'd be having to work out 
um, where profits are sourced, whereas the advantage of something like 010, it's relatively clean. Um, it is very much determined by the sort of regulatory status of a company. We'd probably have to introduce new transfer pricing rules with a territorial tax. And there would have to be quite significant um, rewrite of our tax legislation, which at the moment is obviously very old, very much geared around the system of, of residents. Um, and I think introducing those sorts of changes would be a massive drain on our, on our civil servants and on, on the government. Um, and we really have to be clear that the, the sort of end goal um, was something that we wanted to, to, to aim at. Um, I also challenge whether or not we would actually see a reduction in scrutiny from the OECD and the EU. I know Hong Kong and Gibraltar, talking to my colleagues, um, are still facing changes to their own territorial tax regime. So it's, it's certainly not the panacea, um, but it may be that Guernsey could evolve a regime which is um, sort, of, sort of bespoke, I suppose, for our, for our jurisdiction. I suppose the final point to make is that um, we typically um, introduce our tax policy with reference to what the other Crown dependencies are doing. So I think it would be very important in the way that we look at our corporate tax strategy generally to be very mindful of what's happening in Jersey and Isle of Man, because to do something alone or even mention um, that we're changing to something which could be seen as negative for our international structures could have an immediate impact. People are very fickle. Um, and I've seen this in practice. If there's a, a sort of mention of a tax rate or some change where, dare I say, Jersey's got an advantage, people will move quickly. So it's a very delicate discussion that needs to be had um, with very mindful of, of that. The other side is that we do have um, potentially something coming along, which could be very positive, um, it would seem, in terms of revenue raising. And that's the OECD changes around um, a global minimum rate of tax, or you probably heard it known as Pillar 2. There is an opportunity there um, for Guernsey to actually um, raise revenue by introducing um, a 15% rate of tax. The good thing is we don't have to do that. We have options. And I think in the recent statement that the government made, it was clear that um, whilst we've signed up to this, we, we are evaluating the options. Um, but if we were to introduce that tax, um, it's important to be mindful that there are very specific thresholds. This um, new tax would only apply to very large multinational groups. We're talking about groups with a, a, a consolidated turnover of 750 million euros. And even then, and there are companies in our jurisdiction that are part of such multinational groups, but even then, there's a de minimis where the profits in Guernsey would have to be um, less than, if they're less than a million, you, you're not in scope anyway. So at the moment, we've seen projections of around 10 million from Pillar 2. And the reason is, it's only so many companies that would actually be in scope. And even those could be carved out under the de minimis. Um, so what I would say is it's great that Guernsey signed up to this. I think it's very positive in terms of avoiding future blacklists and things like that, you know, being seen to um, sign up to these sort of initiatives. But it's not necessarily going to be the be all and end all. I don't think it will be enough to think that, well, great, we've got Pillar 2. Basically, we've got 15% tax because those companies are going to have to pay it anywhere because I think the actual effect could be less than we think. But I haven't seen the numbers, and that's something I know that people within the states are working, working hard on at the moment. Thank you very much, Jane. Charles, you mentioned earlier that they, there would be a, a, real, a real problem uh, getting any kind of tax reform, well, certainly getting GST through. Um, a lot of deputies in this, in this term uh, stood on a platform of no new taxes. I, I went through all the various manifestos. It seemed to me around about 30 of the, of the House stood on a, on a no new taxes. Uh, we just need to prioritise spending and cut waste was, was the two main comments that I saw. Um, how, how would you or how could, uh, how, how would you envisage persuading such large numbers of, of your colleagues and potentially the electorate as well. Um, although obviously I don't expect you to, to give away your, your stance, uh, your, your, your game plan for next term. But how would you persuade your colleagues that tax reform really is necessary? Well, indeed, a lot of uh, candidates at the last election stood on uh, platforms of um, no tax increases or even tax reductions. And uh, so, several of them were successful and, uh, and are now sitting deputies. Um, we've had two annual budgets uh, in this uh, term of the states, uh, both passed, uh, if not unanimously, with very substantial majorities, and the spending uh, commitments of every committee, bar one, have increased. 
and the only committee that has seen a reduction in its budget is overseas aid. Now, all those uh, deputies who were elected on platforms of we're going to cut taxes, we're not going to, uh, uh, or we're, um, we're not introducing new ones, we're going to cut public spending, have singularly failed to deliver any reductions in public spending. And it seems to me that when you challenge people, uh, uh, well, you know, why, why don't you uh, uh, reduce the spending of your own committee? It's always, well, no, the cuts need to happen in some other committee's budget. Um, you know, our committee, our committee is uh, sacrosanct. And I confidently predict that uh, the spending of every committee, bar overseas aid, will continue to increase throughout the rest of this term. So the reality is that um, all those uh, claims in those election platforms were bogus. And uh, a whole bunch of people were elected effectively under false pretenses. Now, the, the, the states has is, is got itself into an impasse, as I said earlier. The, the problem is there is a, a looming fiscal deficit um, and, uh, and potentially quite a severe one. Um, and there is no consensus about how to get out of this. Uh, the, the, the preferred option being offered by the policy lead in policy and resources committee will not get through this assembly and it will not be supported by large numbers of members of our community. So I think we have to change the conversation. I don't think personally it's realistic to assume that there are significant uh, cuts to be made in government spending. Uh, as Treasury Minister back in uh, 2012, I was responsible for implementing a financial transformation program, it was called, with an objective of taking £31 million pounds out of uh, the state's then base budget. Uh, it was never achieved. Um, we never got to the 31 million and many of the measures that were introduced to cut state spending effectively just transferred the cost to members of the public by, for example, cutting college grants or increasing fees and charges, that sort of thing. So the actual cost of government was not reduced, it was just shifted over to the user pays in many cases. And um, that, you know, we, we went into that with very good intentions. We were quite serious about trying to take 31 million pounds out of the baseline budgets. But the reality is the States of Guernsey is comparatively lean. Andy was talking earlier about the, con the concept of headroom in the economy for tax increases. A lot of the conversation around that uh, focuses on benchmarking effectively. Well, you know, compared to other similar jurisdictions, how, how are we doing in terms of what we spend to obtain these services? And the answer generally is that Guernsey performs pretty well. Uh, we have a lower cost of government um, per, per capita than, uh, than most other jurisdictions. And um, some would argue that that shows that there's room for increasing uh, taxation in Guernsey because if we're aiming for whatever it is, 22% of GDP and other, other territories are operating on 25% of GDP, doesn't that mean you could raise taxes in Guernsey to, uh, to the sort of benchmark level? Well, no, obviously we need to keep taxes as low as possible while con continuing to provide the services that, that the public need and want. But um, we, we really have it, this problem that um, that uh, if we ha have to raise new taxes, there's no political consensus about how those would be raised. And at the moment, there's massive political resistance to it. And I'm afraid a, a lot of members of the public think that they voted for deputies who are going to cut spending, who haven't cut spending, and who um, have no realistic plan to do so, and in fact, uh, who are now proposing the introduction of a GST. Uh, the public are massively disillusioned. They are, uh, there is a huge amount of disappointment out there. And I think we need to win back trust. And I think we do that, we start that by saying, well, actually, we have some fundamental problems with our fiscal system. The tax laws are very, very old. Our corporate tax system is archaic. 
and um, it's not competitive in the modern world. Other jurisdictions with different tax systems are doing far, far better than Guernsey is. And the idea that we need to preserve 010 because it's important for competitive advantage is just nonsense. Guernsey is one of the laggards in the offshore world. There are other communities doing just a lot better than us. So we need to be prepared to um, take, um, take the public with us on a journey which says we need reform, um, we have to change, the uh, current fiscal policies are not sustainable in the long term, and uh, we, but we will take you, take you, the public, with us, and we will do this in a way that does not impact the resident local population more than it absolutely has to. Thank you very much, Charles. Thank you. Uh, John, Charles has outlined the challenges of getting any kind of tax reform through the states in its current setup, but this would I would imagine equally apply to spending cuts or hard to make decisions that you were talking about earlier. What changes to the machinery of government, which we've heard a lot about, uh, would you like to see to make fiscal reform that much easier? You know, the ones I'd like to see are mostly illegal. So. <laughs> um, uh, we, 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 we've got in a situation where I think Charles is dead right on the politics. Um, we're not gonna get it changed. What, we, what the current government has done is to nab the bond money, which was raised for specific purposes and just put it into general funding. It's let borrowing money <clears throat> off banks in quite substantial quantities. Um, we're laying up actually a problem for the future. As more debt gets on, the more problems we have. We've got other forms of debt, particularly buried in the pension funds in quite large quantities. Uh, interestingly, um, the confidence in our debt is in part reflected in the fact that since Christmas, the bond issue, which you could buy at 140, is now 111, uh, which tells you the world out there now thinks they need a higher yield to cover the risk we have. Um, what could we do to get it better? We probably need a fresh election because we have got a lot of people in there with unrealistic um, positions. I don't believe that it's impossible to cut costs. Of course it's possible. The interesting thing is how much pain you're prepared to take to do it and what you are prepared to live with as an outcome. That's not so easy. But countries have done it. Um, Estonia, Latvia have both done double figure one year reductions uh, in their public spend and taken all the hammer that went with it and come out with very strong economies. It can be done. It requires political will and isn't there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Short and sweet. Um, moving on, Joe, um, we've heard about uh, what are the various pros and cons of the various tax, lever tax levers that have been proposed by PNR, such as the GST. I think in the, in the last time there was a, a health tax uh, and obviously we talked about corporation tax changes. Are there any other tax levers that we could employ? Yeah, thanks, Amy. I mean, obviously, um, I will say a few words about GST, again, purely from the tax practitioner perspective, and I know, I know it's a highly contentious area. So, um, I mean, in terms of the challenges, they're, they're pretty well rehearsed. We know it's a potentially regressive tax, although research has shown that with the right levels of income support, you can actually end up with the lower quartiles um, being um, better off, ironically, but overall, it's generally regressive. Um, it could be very costly, not just for government, but for business. There's the implementation, there's the ongoing compliance. And it has the reputation for being quite complicated. Everyone's heard of the Jaffa Cake case and things like that. You know, it's going to be arguing the toss about silly things that we could be um, better off doing better things with our time. But again, from the purely practitioner's point of view, I just wanted to outline some of the potential opportunities because, you know, I have seen what's happened in Jersey. I've been involved with indirect taxes I mean, in other jurisdictions. Um, <laughs> It is a very effective revenue raising tax. Now that has potential downsides, as has already been mentioned, because if you've got an effective revenue raising tool, you ratchet up the rate and it can kind of get away from you. So some people say, well, that's a blank checkbook. But I mean, it is very effective. And with a high level of um, annual registration threshold, you can actually remove the burden of some small businesses if they don't want to reclaim the GST. And remember that, for example, wages don't have GST attaching to them. 
it can actually bed in quite quickly. Um, in Jersey, for example, I think there was a sort of year or so of slight inflation and obviously a bit of investment, but it has bedded down. I mean, I'd like to say as a practitioner that I spend a lot of my time doing GST advice. I don't because it's, it's relatively straightforward. Everyone's just got on with it um, and it actually hasn't been you know, um, too problematic. Um, Jersey's got a set of legislation. It's basically a simplified form of VAT um, that could be emulated. Um, and it can be a rel relatively simple design with minimal exemptions and a special regime for financial services. Um, other points to make, um, we're talking about the, the sort of burden on residents. Well, at least tourists would pay GST when they came. And also some of perhaps the um, high net worth um, people who perhaps have special tax arrangements, um, there is an element of them um, paying the GST as well. So I think, and even local retailers, and we've seen in Jersey, there is the opportunity for them to be um, protected in terms of importation um, schemes. We've seen the scheme that's been brought in with Amazon. So, so these are just points, I suppose, that I think are often um, ignored because there is, a, you know, obviously a groundswell of opinion against the GST. But in terms of its simplicity and the fact that there's one that's sort of ready-made um, in another jurisdiction, um, it, there are potential opportunities for Guernsey if we chose to go down that route. Health tax, well, I mean, again, that will be very easy to implement because it's basically, as far as I can see, been set up as a form of income tax. So you would just collect the tax in the same way as income tax. Obviously, the downside is it was presented externally as an increase in our income tax rate that it's already relatively high when you add on social security. So, but Jersey seems to have managed it reasonably well with their long-term care charge. Um, we've already talked quite a bit about corporate taxes. I mean, I suppose the only thing about, um, you know, for example, widening the scope of 010, bringing more into the 10 or increasing the rate, there is just this risk of flight um, of businesses um, who might choose to move their operations elsewhere. And I hear what you're saying, Charles, about um, 010 um, and maybe other jurisdictions having a, a more um, effective method of taxation. But I think some of those have different attributes like they're in the EU, for example, like Luxembourg, or some of them um, rely on other forms of taxation like indirect taxes. So, and we do have Jersey. I mean, like it or not, we do have to look very closely at what Jersey is doing, because there is, particularly in the finance sector, a, a level of um, compar comparability. And the final one, I'd like to think that environmental tax um, would be a big one on the agenda. But of course, we all know that that will change behaviours it won't necessarily raise revenues in the long term um, if we manage to change the behaviours. But my personal view is, if we're thinking about economic growth, we should also be thinking about the reputation of the island, what's going to bring in people to the island. And I think a huge plus for Guernsey and young people coming back to the island would be as if we put our money where our mouth is in terms of environmental taxes and doing the right thing there. You know, I think that's a big challenge that we're not talking about today that could be dealt with by environmental taxation and making our island more sustainable. Thank you, Joe. Um, and finally, Andy, um, economic growth through population or, or extra pro productivity is often cited as an option. Um, the government makes the assumption that economic growth will be limited due to the limitations of net migration. Um, what policy decisions such as revision to pop population management um, or, the, or to incentivize underutilized sectors of the workforce such as um, those who are uh, just past retirement but might want to continue in the workforce, um, should we be looking to see from government to promote the economic growth that would reduce the requirement to raise taxes? Uh, I'll come to that bit. Oops. I'll come to that bit momentarily, but in terms of the, the way I looked at the answer to this question was in terms of policy decisions. So yeah, I'll come to absolutely. the growth. But I mean, one policy decision would be to make sure that we have a sustainable tax system for the long term, because we haven't got it. We introduced 010 in 2008. There was a tax review. Uh, we had a corporate tax regime. I rule that we never introduced a territorial tax in 2011. I got Charles Doddy and I remember Joe and I got Tony there that were on the working tax working group. It would have got the monkey off our back about being a tax haven and having a zero rate. And we talk about whether it's a sustainable system. The amount of times over the last 10 years where I've heard people from the finance sector complain that they're getting grief because of, a, you know, there, there is an awful lot of business that anecdotally will have gone elsewhere that you can't measure, but you can say, well, look at the comparison of how we fared against other jurisdictions in those last 10 years. Look at the size of the finance sector, relatively speaking, in you know, real terms. 
it has declined in that 10 year period. We've had growth in various bits of the industry, but they've been in what I'd call support secondary businesses. So consultancy, accounting, I don't mean to disrespect, but it's, it's businesses, it's, it's costs to the primary export sector, which is financial services. So a policy decision to actually say, look, we need it for the long term, we need to sort it out, we need to sort it out once and for all. And it'd be unpalatable to a lot of people personally. And I do believe it requires a corporate tax reform. And I do believe it'll incorporate GST. And I do believe it'll incorporate revisions to the social security and income tax regime. And it will incorporate other matters. The reason why I get frustrated, and I get I'm bouncing up and down when talking about spending earlier was, we've got a long-term issue, and we've got a short-term issue. In the short term, we keep spending more money than we intend to, and it grows faster than we're planning. So it's gone three times, the rate of growth of spending has been three times the rate of growth of GDP over the last 10 years. We've been spending money as if the good times existed from 2005, 2006, and the penny's not dropped. You can't do that anymore. Because what we've got to do is pay for the long-term issue. Now, I'm, a, I'm an economist, as Steve said, and I used to do this public policy lecture and I, I never got a good exam question answer for this obviously clearly with my explanation of the, the question but what it is is imagine you're baking a cake and the economy is basic we're baking a cake and the amount of bakers you've got depends on how big a cake you can have or how many cakes you can have but what we've got is mouths to feed and we've got more mouths to feed and so basically what we're what are it's happening to our economy is that we've got less bakers and more people eating the cake and that's basically it that's our long-term issue now, the problem is, if we're spending resources unnecessarily in the short run, we've got less to go around for the long term. So that problem just gets bigger and bigger. So that's why I get frustrated about it, especially when we delude ourselves that we're doing a great job, because we haven't. So anyway, but back to the points. So if you add in a revised corporate regime, and you add in reduction of expenditure and greater control, actually one thing Charles didn't say is, back in 2009, we introduced a real-term freeze on public spending and public spending didn't increase for the next four or five years in real terms. And it closed the gap. And that was it, basically. Uh, but it's, it's there again because we've uh, spending's gone up. Now, the other thing is, in terms of population and control, yes, the workforce is the cake analogy. So if we can have some more bakers, please. Now, when I came to the island, this was in 2008, we just introduced the population control regime. Well, actually just introduced the policy, but not the actual control regime to do it. But housing very did uh, police it very well, and population was more or less static for the next 10 years. Now, I did some analysis back in 2013, and I said, look, we'll lose about 0.5% of growth per annum from that policy because of the lack of growth of workers. And lo and behold, if you look at it now, our workforce is no different to what it was. And that would have been another 7% of GDP. And if I work it out, you work out shares off, that's another 30, 40 million pounds worth of, of income. And don't tell me that the, okay, we were reacting to the, the unsustainable growth rates of 2005, 2006, where you had 20, 25% growth in the fits and fund sector and the associated overheating with that. But we haven't had overheating for 10 years. And when we talk about the, the sort of the overcrowding of the island, and actually Horace Camp for a change did a good article the other day, when he said it's, it's actually numbers of households that's the issue. We've got more households, not more people. And so we expect every household to have a place to live. Well, on a finite land space, you can't all have a, a three up, three down, and, and a garden front and back and a driveway and a garage, because there isn't space. So that would be it in terms of my prescription. And yes, some small measures at the, at the, at the sidelines to increase sort of the, the workforce into, the, into old age. But quite frankly, uh, if people want to work, you know, you're talking middle classes, basically, they're going to be working in the late 60s. It's not manual laborers that want to work in the late 60s. Um, then people are doing it anyway, quite frankly. And it's, it, you just want to reduce the inequities in the system and make it simple. So combination of corporate tax regime be control and, and steadfast on the spending, increasing the population and manage that. I always assumed that we would aim for a, a fixed dependency ratio, not like, a, well, the population can't move then. And that would be a way to, to, to manage it, in my view. Um, and at the end of the day, like I say, one thing on tax is that, the last thing I'll say about tax is, King John introduced income tax to the UK, because what happens with spending is, it, over time, it grows. So if you go back to the Napoleonic Wars, it's about 6%. You go back to the First World War, it's 12%. These are the UK numbers. And you go to the UK now, it's about 45%, because governments just grow. And the expenditure just grows and grows and grows and grows. And that's what happens over time. And actually, what we have to do is to find other things to tax. So you started off with wealth. You know, the kings would tax the barons and stuff like that. King John found that he couldn't fund his wars anymore. What he needed was more money, so he had to tax income. 
And as you go on, you know, the, the governments have got bigger in the 21st century, they have to tax consumption because everyone does. Some people have wealth, many people have income, everyone consumes. Thank you very much, Andy. Thank you. And thank you to all the panellists. Uh, before we finish, do we have time for some questions? We have time for questions. Excellent. Uh, but first off, does anyone have any questions? Oh, we have one. Yes. Paul. squandering the opportunity sorry i think the states are squandering the opportunity to to, um, to, to encourage that industry we, we had seven applications for licenses last year one was approved um and i know that there's at least three businesses that have folded another one that's moving elsewhere um our business at the moment is having to look as to whether we stay in guernsey or move elsewhere as well so my question really is it's all very well looking at expenditure, but why don't we encourage new industry, new businesses to come to Guernsey, bring more employment, more tax revenue, et cetera? Excellent point. Uh, I, I think, I think I'll, 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 I'll pass that to whoever wants to catch that particular hot potato. Charles, excellent. Yeah, um, I'm all for economic diversification and I've got nothing against the cannabis industry. Um, I'm one of those members of the states who've publicly said that I would legalize and regulate um, cannabis production and consumption in Guernsey. But I have to say, um, I don't see cannabis as a, a panacea for Guernsey's economic woes. Uh, at the end of the day, it's a horticultural business. Um, it uh, is it's a relatively low wage business. And um, the, the product uh, in terms of just raw cannabis is, is not particularly valuable. I think what would be interesting potentially is um, the process of refining cannabis down into medicinal compounds. And, and uh, in other words, the, the sort of later stages of production of higher value goods. But even there, I can't see this as anything more than a a possibly interesting adjunct to um, the rest of our eco economy. The reality is that we uh, derive 40, 44% of our income from uh, financial services, and that sector is in decline. Uh, in uh, 2009, it employed 7,150 people approximately in Guernsey, and in 2021, it employed 5,850. It has declined by 15% since effectively the introduction of 010. So we actually do have to think creatively, and I totally agree with the, the speaker's uh, point. We have to think about alternative high value added, low footprint businesses that can help to take up the slack. There's, there is no silver bullet out there. There is no other industry that has the potential to do for Guernsey what the financial services industry did for Guernsey. But there are, I believe, other, in, other sectors that we could be exploring. I've long advocated that we uh, look at higher education as a business, and I've said we should think about setting up a, a, an international university on Guernsey because I think it's an interesting uh, business proposition. And um, there are, will no doubt be other ideas from people in this room, including cannabis. Uh, we ne do need to think creatively. We do need to take, be prepared to take some risks. And we do need to recognize that financial services has had its heyday. It's not going to go away overnight, fortunately, but it is in slow decline. And we need to think about what we can do to help support it. Thank you. John, uh, John. Can I just leap in and say, um, clearly we need to get new industries going. One thing that the government's promised repeatedly is they're going to reduce regulation. Not a bloody thing has happened. And, you know, that is no cost, none. You know, if we can get some of that through, we should get it through. Thank you, John. Are there any other questions out there? Yes. 
Oh, thank you. Um, I'm just picking up on your point, um, Charles, that we need more um, uh, activity on the island that's going to bring in tax revenue. And one of the things that um, occurs, well, is, is blindingly obvious, is our uh, revision of our um, education strategy. What seems to be missing is the world is changing and the world is changing very, very rapidly. And where is the digital expertise on this island? Because one of the great advantages we have in Guernsey is that no longer do people have to be territorially tied. So there's a huge opportunity there, which we seem to be ignoring. Yeah, um, I, I totally agree with that. I think um, digital industries are exactly the sort of profile of high value added, low footprint businesses that, that would be potentially attractive to Guernsey. We also have a pretty good fiber network uh, connecting us to the rest of the world. And, and in fact, we're sitting very close to uh, some of the main information highways in the world. The, for example, the cross channel fiber links between Cornwall and New York. Um, uh, you know, in, in terms of fiber optics, we're, we are a, a blink of an eye away from that main highway. So um, there, there is potential, but it's very difficult to create a digital economy. We can do more to train people um, and the digital greenhouse is, has done a great job uh, in uh, as a sort of seedbed for new businesses. We need much more dig digital education in schools, which I think was your point. And um, uh, but you know, I, I I'd love the vision of a sort of Shoreditch on sea. I I would just love to see Guernsey develop in that direction. But I think getting those entrepreneurs over from places like Shoreditch, Amsterdam, wherever, to set themselves up in Guernsey is going to involve in intervention on a very wide scale because many of them can't afford to buy houses here. Um, they would struggle with um, getting the, the staff they need here. Um, it's to, to create a culture, a whole business um, community around digital services is not a, a not an easy task. I know what you're going to say. <laughs> I know what you're going to say, and I was going to say. It isn't just encouraging those digital businesses to come here. We have absolute barriers to operating here at the moment. Guernsey is the hardest place in the world to grow a digital business from. You know, we discriminate against any non-finance business by our registry like hiding who owns the business so we can't have access to payment platforms who won't operate in Guernsey and this is just an ongoing issue that we're trying to change but I have now been talking about well for too many years but you know you, you can't even get Stripe in Guernsey to get an Apple account you have to put in a UK postcode you know the list is endless but as a, a business growing in Guernsey that holds us back as a business trying to grow worldwide they move elsewhere and as a business trying to come here it's a complete barrier so things to note yeah <laughs> it, 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 can, I, can I just say that it also ties into the the tax discussion we've just had because you know let's suppose you're a games developer for example and you want to market your wonderful new game all around the world royalties that you might receive from the United States, which is very likely going to be your biggest market, are going to suffer US withholding tax of 30% because there's no double tax treaty between Guernsey and the USA. And you could set that business up in Portugal or anyone, any one of a large number of other countries, and it would be far more tax efficient to do so. So you're absolutely right. The, the, the difficulties of doing this are immense. But you have to start somewhere. And I don't think Guernsey is ever going to get an equality of tax treatment from jurisdictions like the United States, while our corporate standard rate of corporate tax is 0%. People just don't make double tax treaties with 0% countries. Thank you very much, Charles. And I'm afraid we've run out of time there. So apologies to the two people who are looking to, to, to ask questions there. But um, we finished there for now. Uh, obviously, I hope you all have a, a good discussion about tax and and and, uh, and what we need to do in the future. Um, 
I, I just ask, ask you all to give your appreciation to the panelists here in the, in the usual way. Thank you.